Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Americans have always talked about the link between education and individual success. But in an earlier age, when wealth flowed from factory smokestacks, only a few professionals, ministers, lawyers, doctors, needed to attend, much less graduate from college. Today, when wealth flows from the command of knowledge and the control of information, a college education has become a practical necessity for individuals and for society as well. A vibrant higher education infrastructure is increasingly the critical difference between regional success and regional stagnation. Although Northern Kentucky University is little more than 35 years old, it has quickly matured into an imposing postmodern campus, even adding dormitories in the 1990s as a way to diversify its student body. Last April, the NKU board selected James Vitruba as its fourth president, although on the job since this summer, Dr. Vitruba was officially installed as president just two weeks ago with a combination of academic pomp and spirited rallies punctuated by colorful balloons. I am joined this morning by Dr. Vitruba. Before joining NKU, Dr. Vitruba was a professor of education and vice provost at Michigan State University. He also served as an administrator at the State University of New York at Binghamton, Binghamton and on the faculty at the University of Illinois and Drake University. Welcome to Newsmakers. Nice to be here, Dan. Thank you. You know, sometimes I think people who come into an area from the outside, who haven't been here forever, and I think you'll find out there's a lot of us who were born <laughs> here and never leave, um, have a better view of or have some, some important insights about uh, the new place that, that natives don't have. What's your, what are your early observations? coming most recently from Michigan, as we were mentioning. What are your, most, what are your observations about conditions here in Greater Cincinnati? My observation on, uh, regarding both sides of the river is that this is, a, uh, uh, this is an area that is vital, energetic, growing, has a sense of its own future, uh, and is uh, excited about that future. I mean, I see that both north and south of the river. I've spent uh, these first three months uh, in this area uh, in a set of conversations both across the campus and across the region, talking about the region and its future, the role the university should play in that future. And uh, what I hear is, this is my fifth community. Mm -hmm. This is my fifth uh, university. Uh, all communities don't feel like this one. Uh, and it's important, I think, to say that. Uh, uh, there's a sense, both north and south of the river, that uh, this is our time, I believe. Uh, when you say that not all areas feel that way, I, I think sometimes, and especially right at the moment, we, we're faced, uh, and maybe news promotes this, that there's a lot of problems facing us right now and a lot of crises, and we, we see leadership arguing with each other. Uh, you know, you said some nice things there. Are you being serious, or is that just oh, no, I'm, uh, I'm a new being, person to the block here? I'm being very serious. Uh, look, at, look at what this community, uh, as I move around this community and talk about the issues that will drive this community over the next uh, 10 years or so, what do I hear? I hear uh, regionalism. I hear workforce. In every conversation I had across this region, workforce was a key issue, both the education of the existing workforce but also the broadening of the workforce pool. The reason for that is because the economy is thriving. Things are growing. New companies are coming to northern Kentucky. Uh, <clears throat> when we, uh, the university is going to weigh in on this workforce issue because we, we, will, we will thrive and prosper to the extent that this region continues to thrive and prosper. We have the fastest growing airport in the world, I believe, in the greater, uh, greater Cincinnati, uh, northern Kentucky International Airport. Uh, I see the university and universities as a whole as a knowledge hub in the same way that the uh, uh, airport is a transportation hub. Let's talk a little bit about <coughs> these conversations that you've had. How many people uh, participate? Because I think this is an interesting first exercise now, for about, somebody coming in. About 600 people. Uh, uh, higher education in the nation and higher education in the Commonwealth of Kentucky is going through enormous change. There are periods in the life of industries that are characterized by enormous transformation. Uh, that's going on in, uh, in colleges and universities today, and it's being driven nationally by a set of forces. You mentioned them in, in your introduction. Most fundamentally, it's the changing learning needs of the public. Today, one doesn't learn across the lifespan to, to fill spare time. One learns because they ha you have to learn to stay uh, current in one's job, to prepare for a new job, whatever it happens to be. Technology is changing uh, higher education, the way we, who we serve, where we serve them, when we serve them, how we serve them. Uh, and the public is demanding greater accountability in part because, as you said in your introduction, 
uh, higher education is, I believe, more at the center of the public agenda because knowledge is the gateway to economic competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So all of that is going to be very important. As you talk to people, I'm sure you were not just talking about the area, you were talking about NKU and how it fits into the yes. area. Mm -hmm. There are other universities here, certainly the University of Cincinnati, Xavier University, then colleges, a number of, uh, yep. of other. In your mind, what are, from what you were hearing, and in your mind from what you distilled from all of that, how do you see NKU fitting into that educational infrastructure? Well, first, this area is blessed with a large and diverse array of, of, uh, of higher education institutions, as you say, colleges and universities. They are strong. Uh, they're well connected with the public interest, with the public need. Uh, I see us as follows. We're, 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 as you said, we're a young university. We're 30 years old this year, 25 years on the Highland Heights campus. Uh, a university's reputation generally lags behind reality by about 10 years. Uh, we are a uh, 12,000 student campus. About 1,000 live on campus. Uh, we have, uh, uh, by a recent study by the, uh, the uh, Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education, a study of alumni satisfaction, we have the largest uh, or the, the highest level of alumni satisfaction of any university in the Commonwealth. Uh, we are a university that, uh, is, that prides itself on being learner-centered, being uh, very affordable, uh, being uh, high quality. We uh, have a lot of evening programs, a lot of weekend, we will have a lot of weekend programs, concentrated programs. I see our niche in this area as being high quality, low cost, uh, highly accessible, and with a focus on learning across the lifespan. When you and I had the opportunity to read your inaugural address, you stressed this idea of being a learner university as opposed to a research university or a number of other images yes, that could mm -hmm. be used. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that important? Why is that the way and that the mission of NKU? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why it's important for higher education generally in my judgment, and, and this, this goes for NKU as well. Uh, I believe that too many universities have lost sight of who they serve. And they have become, uh, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing any particular university, but I believe nationally we have become sometimes focused on being faculty-centered, teaching-centered, uh, research-centered, service-centered. All of that needs to focus on the learner. This may seem like a, a fine cut to the general public, but it is fundamental to what we are about. We, we will be about research. We'll put a focus on undergraduate education. But, but always we need to have our focus on what impact we're having on the learner. And the learner for us will be different in the 21st century than it was for the 20th century. How? How is that going to be different? It will be different by, uh, uh, because of the expectations of the learner. Our, our industry has become uh, what I would refer to as demonopolized over the last 10 years. Uh, we have more and more uh, providers coming in doing what higher education has traditionally done. It's not unlike what banking went through 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if you were going to engage in, uh, in, uh, in a banking transaction, you went to a bank. Today, you can go anywhere. Everybody's in banking. Well, there's a whole new set of educational providers who are involved in post-secondary education. Uh, we, will, uh, we will continue to serve not only the student right out of high school, but the, uh, the uh, single mom who wants to come back and, uh, and uh, uh, get a degree in order to enhance uh, her own economic uh, stability. Uh, the uh, working adult uh, will take, uh, the, the learner in the 21st century is going to expect us to be much more user friendly, to come to them as well as expecting them to always come to us. When we talk about the 21st century or even today to that to some extent for the people who aren't involved on a day by day basis in universities, instantly computers, yep. internet, web, yep. all that comes to mind almost as a sense that technology is going to be the magic pill that's going to change everything. What's your view about the role, the long-term role, as much as we can talk about long-term sure. with technology? Uh, how's that going to change that learner-centered university in the future? It's going to change what we need to accomplish in terms of our curriculum and how we go about accomplishing it. And, and let me be real specific on this. We, we've had a lot of conversation both on campus and in the region about the role of technology. Technology works well uh, as a standalone if one is dealing with graduate professional education, with engineers who want, want education delivered on site so that they can learn particular areas of knowledge that are important for them to learn. When you start talking about undergraduate students, it is a different story. I, my belief is that you have to combine high, what we call high tech and high touch. 
that, that nothing is going to replace the kind of up-close and personal interaction of the sort that we're having right now and that faculty at NKU are deeply committed to. Now, technology will augment that. Technology will help us augment the instructor. Uh, so, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's referred to as, re as replacing the sage on the stage with a guide on the side. Uh, we will have, uh, uh, we, will, we will take our programs uh, uh, much more aggressively to the learner. We may have programs in the future that will bring the student to campus two or three times rather than two or three times a week, it'll be two or three times a semester, and uh, augment that by having them interact with a faculty member via the internet. Uh, we'll use uh, video, uh, two-way interactive video, real-time and, and, and asynchronous. Uh, but all that will be, will, will augment the kind of fundamental interaction that exists between a faculty member and a, and but a student. But the fundamental is still the Fundamental personal. is still there, yeah. Given the fact that NKU mm -hmm. is as young as it is, given the fact that you're at the beginning of a new administration here, over the, not the long term, but over the near term, next three to five years, what are the highest priorities as you see them at this point? The, uh, the, the highest priorities will be around the following. We will become um, uh, much more disciplined in our enrollment management and a focus on recruiting and retention. What I've learned in these conversations is that the public in this region doesn't know about the university and we need to spend more time telling our story. Uh, they need to understand the quality of education that's available at this newest of, of, uh, of the region's universities. Uh, we will focus on, uh, on our curriculum and what we're trying to achieve with our curriculum. We'll look at, uh, at our undergraduate curriculum as more than a collection of uh, uh, a kind of cafeteria of studies where one has to choose uh, amounts from across a range of subjects. But, but we'll ask some fundamental questions. What are we trying to achieve with our, comp with our curriculum? What are we educating for? And we'll spend a lot of time on that over the next few years. Uh, we'll look at how we uh, become more aggressively involved in workforce education and training. And my intention is to form a new unit in that regard that will be very uh, agile, very customer focused, very outcomes driven. And we'll work with business and industry in this region to broker not only our own intellectual resources, but worldwide intellectual resources on, on behalf of business and industry in this area. Uh, those are the kind of things that we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be making our case in Frankfurt. We'll be coming, becoming uh, uh, more uh, involved in private fundraising because that's going to be important. We want people in this region to see the university as an investment, not an expense, but an investment in their own future. Uh, we'll be looking at becoming less dependent on the semester system. Nothing sacrosanct about the semester system. We'll be asking students when they want to learn, uh, where they want to learn, in what form they want to learn and we'll tailor our programs accordingly. One of the things that over the last year people who maybe don't know a whole lot about NKU, one of the things they heard about was uh, an announcement that there was going to be a football team. <laughs> I thought I was done talking about football. Well, there. you know, <laughs> no, I, go I ahead. think if I didn't ask it somebody would say go ahead. why not. No, no, that's fine. What about that uh, decision and where does that stand? I understand, sure. I know that you reversed that decision at this <laughs> stage, but uh, where does that stand? Well, it, it stands as follows. I, I, uh, I'm a strong supporter of football, love football. Uh, my la last eight years at Michigan State has been great uh, uh, involvement with football. Oh, they have a football team. Uh, they have a football team. You, you, Penn State knows they have a football <laughs> team. Uh, the, the issue for NKU at this point is a bottom line issue. Uh, the facts are that to put a competitive Division II scholarship football program on the field would cost us in subsidy about a million two a year. I can't afford a million two a year. The university can't afford a million two a year. Uh, that, that stands alongside of our need to bring our other sports up to at least the average funding for that sport at the national level. Once we accomplish that, and, and, uh, and of course the other piece in that, Dan, is, is uh, Title IX. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you bring a hundred uh, athletes, uh, male athletes, uh, into your sports program, you're obliged to bring a hundred female athletes into the sports program. If you add a hundred lockers, you add a hundred lockers. If you add training facilities, you add comparable training facilities. It is an enormous cost. Now, we're committed to gender equity, whether the law requires it or not. It is important for us to do. But it is not possible to do financially with, with a football program at NKU. So we will continue to uh, promote all of our sports, male and female, and we will continue to highlight our basketball program. Uh, they beat a very strong uh, Lewis uh, team last night, and uh, um, 
my intention is to continue to make that kind of be the cornerstone program with our link with the public for the time being. Mm -hmm. Down the road, we'll pick up football again, I believe. And we'll, we'll reconsider football, but there's some things that we need to do first before we do that. Now, one of the questions for a university is the quality of the student coming in. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of concern in America as a whole mm -hmm. and in this area about the quality of elementary and secondary education. Mm -hmm. What is, what should be the university's attitude about the students that it admits who maybe aren't fully prepared just to plunge into uh, traditional academic work on a university level? Yeah, I don't think, that, I think the responsibility we have is to create an environment in which all students can succeed. If we're admitting students into programs where they can't succeed, we're not doing justice to them or to anyone else. Uh, there's a couple things we need to do. We need to be far more aggressive as an industry in supporting the, the strengthening of elementary and secondary education in Kentucky and in Ohio and every other place. We just need to do that. This, is, this ought to be seamless, and it's not seamless right now. So we need to be more aggressive in and that And I regard. might point out, your background in terms of teaching has been in education schools. Is that's, that right? that's, that's correct, okay. yes. Uh, second, we need to say to the area high schools and to the students in those high schools, uh, we, are, uh, we are a university that is broadly accessible, uh, but we will not admit you into our regular curriculum until you demonstrate that you're prepared for that curriculum. Now that would mean, uh, uh, it may mean for us creating a university college or another mm -hmm. kind of, uh, of uh, unit on campus where students with uh, major developmental uh, needs uh, where those needs can be addressed in a concentrated way with, through advisement, through uh, courses that strengthen math skills, reading skills, writing skills. But uh, it, is, it is wrong, I believe, for those students to go into the regular curriculum uh, because they will not succeed by and large. And we need, but, but let me just say one other thing, okay. Dan. It is not only the quality of the student who comes to us, but higher education needs to spend more time on the quality of the student who leaves us. I mean, we need to look at what we're producing. Well. And that's a major issue for us. Thank you about. for joining us this morning. We're out of time. Uh, welcome to Cincinnati. Thank you, And I uh, hope that you'll be a guest in the future here on, uh, on Newsmakers. This has been fun. Thanks so much. Thank you. Stay tuned. From the windows of houses no one else valued and from his bed in the midst of long fast, Maurice McCracken has challenged our consciences with a gentle voice of someone who takes the Christian gospel seriously. After the break, we will talk to the man who's been called the conscience of Cincinnati. Welcome back. Right now, as this show is airing, the faculty and alumni of Xavier University are presenting the Reverend Maurice McCracken with the St. Francis Xavier Medal. Earlier this week, Mac, as he is known by his friends, and he calls almost everyone friend, celebrated his 92nd birthday while reminding everybody that life begins at 90. For years, Mac has challenged us to live the principles we often too easily espouse. Since he arrived in Cincinnati in 1945, Mac has progressively challenged racism, war, the death penalty, and prison system. As a tax resistor and a protester, he has been hauled into court and sent off to jail time after time. At other times, he has fasted when he felt injustice was going unheeded. Last Thursday, I spent several hours with Mac at the nursing home where he now lives. I first met Mac back in the 60s as a middle-class suburban kid who found himself called to protest an unjust war. Mac taught me, by example, how to challenge out of love, not hate. In 1992, I had the privilege of covering Mac as a reporter during his fast to protest the destruction of the Milner Hotel, which served the poor. I pretend no sense of false objectivity. I am humbled in Mac's presence and see him as a real-life prophet in the biblical tradition, a person sent to Cincinnati to call all of us to our better selves. Here's a portion of last week's interview. Mac, Xavier University is giving you the St. Francis Xavier Award this Sunday. Is that important to you? Is these sorts of awards important to you? Oh, they're very important to me. I feel that uh, Xavier are more a part of the establishment, quote, is identifying when you give this award with my civil disobedience, with going to prison, with my activities. And uh, that didn't stop them from doing what they did. So often uh, people think about a good thing and then they find a good reason not to do it because the public won't like it. 
Well, I don't know whether that's in it or not. But. You've worked a lot over the years to uh, heal divisions between people, particularly different racial groups. Do you think things have improved in your lifetime, or are we still facing the same problems? Well, I don't think they've moved very far, at least not moved far enough. I still think it's a real divided society as far as power control is concerned. And that there have been breaks down among people, but in terms of who makes the decisions, it's uh, the people that have political power. Uh, I listened to, uh, listened to the radio once and uh, somebody said that most politicians are the shadow of big business. I say, move oh, where the big business wants them so they can get more money in order to do the program, which may be shutting out a lot of people. And I think, though, in terms of neighborhoods, that there are more people that are getting together, realizing they have a lot in common, and that there's a growth in this area. But so far as political power, with the administration at Washington and you talk about living on the periphery and the importance of that. How do you maintain that over a lifetime? Where do you find the strength to live on the periphery? I think a lot, a lot of times people say that, well, I just uh, am not able to do it. I, I can't meet a crisis. And I think that we talk about this physical adrenaline, which we, in an emergency, we get extra power. And I think there's a spiritual adrenaline if we have done our best to what I call building inside braces to withstand the outside pressures, that then when the crisis comes, we discover that we can do and accept uh, what we <laughs> before that would say we couldn't do. Probably what most people know about you is that you don't pay your taxes, that you're opposed to uh, war, and that you uh, stand up for those sorts of things. At our church, we would always take out the toy guns and tanks, not give to the children. And uh, so uh, we did that, uh, the faithful. And then one day, while I was in the office, and he said, Mac, I see you take out all these military toys from what the kids get. but." Did you ever think, when you pay your income tax, that you are giving money for someone to be killed or to be killed? And I really hadn't faced that issue until I became a part of part of Peacemakers. And uh, for a long time, I refused a part. That which I felt, I guess, a seventy percent or so that went into military things. And, and then I send that, and not anymore. But then I realized that the IRS isn't going to divide up what you send and put it where I want it. And as far as participation in the whole system, I could do it with $200, uh, as well as you had a lot of dollars in resist. And the real purpose when you get down to it is because in conscience, you can't do. I think there's one set of moral laws, and we don't live in a dual verse, where you have one set of moral laws for one group and another for another. That uh, this is the universe, and that we should require the same standards of inclusiveness of everybody. How do you hope that you'll be remembered? Well, my hope is not that I be remembered, but that those with me and in the movement be remembered. I remember once there was some kind of a demonstration uh, downtown, and there were a number of carrying signs, so I got a sign and started carrying it, and then somebody, one of the papers that said that I was leading a protest. I wasn't leading it, I joined in it. And I do feel that often the people that are really the heart of a movement who give more time and more effort are as much or more often a part of changing.